Good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, everybody uh, in the room and everybody watching us from home. Uh, it's a pleasure, again, to be celebrating the BK Talks. We are slowly going back to normal. So I think from today, we don't even need to wear masks, which is a, which is a news and uh, that makes us happy. Besides other things that make us so unhappy, uh, also happening at this moment uh, in present. Um, I'm very happy to be hosting today the panel Disseminate, Present and Future of Editorial Practice. Let's see how the, uh, how the subtitle develops. Uh, for that, we have two people from B News uh, who have worked very hard in preparing this panel. They are Twain and Alessandro. Um, and then in the room, we have Enrique, Carlo, Mark, Merrill, and Andre. They are sitting behind me. Alessandro and Twain will properly present you, introduce you to the, uh, to the audience. And we have a few video features from other authors uh, that are not here with us today, Iker, Nuria, Ethel, and Ilka, who will also be introduced by Twain and, uh, and uh, Alessandro. Um, let me see. Yes. Twain and Alessandra, as I mentioned earlier, they are part of the editorial uh, committee or the, the editorial team of B News. B News, they will also introduce it. I am letting themselves introduce everything tonight, but uh, I am really happy to have been working for over two or three months even in the preparation of this, uh, of this BK Talks today with them. It's been a pleasure to discuss about, about publishing, about editing, about writing and disseminating architectural or design ideas uh, in general with them. So uh, I'm happy that this is happening. B News is a very long uh, tradition, has a very long tradition of, uh, it's a, well, you all know that, a students run magazine uh, that, which is published every month. And I'm very happy to have this conversation that goes a little bit beyond the topics we usually talk about here at the faculty. I have with me the latest, um, the latest issue. Uh, I don't know exactly what to say else about publishing. I can, know, I can say that I have some experience about publishing. I consider myself an old-fashioned editor. Uh, that started research thinking that in order to move forward or in order to publish or in order to uh, disseminate something, you needed to doubt. That's, I, that's why I always use this picture. Uh, this is a picture I took in the, in the idea store of uh, Tower Hamlets in London. And I like this image, no? I like this moment of reflection and especially the, this moment of doubt in that man. I don't know if this person knows that I am using his image so often and I don't even know if if he should actually get copyrights. I, I have no idea, but I really like that moment of reflection and doubt, which has driven me through the years to research and to publish, which is what I have done actually a lot, and that's why I'm actually very, very happy to have be having this conversation here, because I would like other generations and other thinkers to let us know where publishing should get going. No? But this is our, some of the books and magazines and journals where, where where I was in charge of, and we were, at some point, we were really interested in the way we occupy territory, and we were interested in social housing and collective housing, and the fabrication of the city through housing, the fabrication of the city throughout civic facilities, and the capacity of public architecture to trigger uh, uh, other movements, about the capacity of these buildings to bring life into the, uh, into the city. Um, then we were very much interested in the, in the uh, public space. You know? Public space has also catalyzer of uh, in general public life. Uh, we try to analyze those projects from a very different way. We try to move away from the traditional way in which uh, architecture or urbanism was featured, trying to understand not only the layers that make public space, but at the same time, we ended up not showing only pictures of or texts about uh, projects. We try to show, and this is maybe a little bit pretentious, what were the strategies behind those projects that other authors could actually end up, let's say, copy-pasting um, in, in, in a way. So anyway, I've spent a lot of time, of my, a lot of my life, uh, trying to understand other people's work and trying to interpret it for others. Uh, then, uh, yeah, 
life goes on and uh, a heat, huge economical crisis hits you and you need to move away from where you live and you end up uh, trying to understand what happened in the country where you come from and why do you have to move away. And then in the end, I was actually asked to do another publication which is spent, where I spent another three years of my life. So this is just to say that today's topic is pretty, uh, let's say, um, interesting for me because I would like to know what other things, uh, what other things about what is it that we should do next when it comes to publications? No, I ended up here, as I said, and uh, also here we try to disseminate all the research and all the speculation that we do at the uh, at the uh, at the Wave Factory throughout this uh, Future City series, all these books that we have been producing, or um, we were also editors of this uh, Manifesta publication for the last biennial in Marseille. And where we try to, let's say, trigger uh, ideas about how to change the city. No? And finally, I was appointed deputy editor of, uh, of Domus in 2019, where we had this manifesto, everything is urbanism, and we end up trying to show the world what others were doing in order to tackle certain uh, pressing urgencies, pressing issues. That's what I have been doing through many years, and I insist, this is why I'm so happy that here we have this panel uh, to talk about that. In any case, this is how I feel. This is how I always felt as an editor, uh, just like Philippe did when he tried to um, walk from, or he did actually walk from one tower to the other, no? using that bar and trying not to look into the void. And using that bar, the bar is a metaphor for me. The bar for me in order to move from one tower to the other is actually a doubt, which is what I was uh, talking about. So I'm going to hand in the word to uh, Alessandro Antoine, Please go ahead. Uh, I'll let you introduce our panelists, and I hope that we have a, a fun, nice, lively conversation. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello, everyone. So my name is Twin, and... My name is Alessandro. Hello. Yes. Hi. And we're co-moderating this uh, BK Talks tonight, and... I'm, I'm going to start off to tell you what Bay News is. So Bay News is a student-run platform and monthly periodical for the whole faculty of architecture and the built environment of TU Delft. And since our first issue in 19 the 1970s till today, the format of Bay News has changed so much. And back in the old days, it served as a communication tool between the faculty and the students. So like a place where you share exam dates and public event schedules. And slowly through the years, it has turned into a place where everyone can contribute to it by ways of critical topics relevant to contemporary issues, uh, personal interests, curiosities, and then turn them into little stories or uh, graphic pieces or articles that doesn't necessarily have to be about architecture. So for example, like this one is about how to negotiate through handshake at a fruit market, bootleg or bad copies of things around the world, iconic films done on a budget, and finally, lost and found in our faculty. So you can find us online through our website or other social media outlets. If you are in this building right now, honestly, you can find a copy of our latest Bay News everywhere in the corner of you walking in and out. You see the current issue right here, which just co coincidentally also matching this orange hall. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so. So, <laughs> so slowly through the year, um, right here, this is our current editing team, and we're very happy to be here. So it, even though this is the current team, we actually change every two years, and it's almost like the magazine exists by itself, and we would like to keep this initiative going and leave the door open to more exciting ideas from you all. Yeah. Okay. So as we introduce ourselves, it's time to, to introduce our panelists today. We have panelists here in the room, but we also have uh, um, experts that are not here that um, sent us videos 
and we will talk about that later. But we um, we start from uh, uh, from Enrique. Enrique is a, um, is a PhD architect and uh, associate uh, lecturer at the ATSA in Madrid. And since 2000 and, since 2006, uh, he has worked with Immaculanda Molwinda as an independent critic and editor, writing for various international uh, magazines and periodicals. And nowadays he's actually also conducting a podcast about contemporary cities called uh, um, The City After All. Uh, importantly, since 2012, he's been responsible for the, for the curation of the architecture section of El Cultural, which is the kind of a weekly magazine uh, as part of uh, the newspaper El Mundo, which is a widely read newspaper in, uh, in Spain. A lot of you might know Andre, which is a teacher, and Leigh Radman is a teacher uh, here at TU Delft. He's been teaching design and theory courses and is part of the theory and philosophy um, uh, section of the faculty. Uh, he's also a licensed architect, educated in Croatia, where he's, where he's originally from, but also here in t at TU Delft. And he's editor of um, a peer-reviewed journal for architecture theory, Footprint. And his personal research focuses on new materialist ecologies and radical empiricism. Um, then we have, on my left, there is, oh, sorry. There is Carlo, Carlo Menon. Um, he's a... Um, He's a researcher, but also uh, oh, thank you. but also founder of um, uh, co-founder of uh, the magazine Accatone, which is a Brussels-based uh, uh, magazine, which is sort of the fruit of uh, um, the research of his practice uh, that he conducts together with uh, uh, Sophie Dars, um, and uh, he also teaches uh, in uh, um, design in Brussels and representation in uh, Eindhoven. But he's also actually undertaking a PhD um, in, uh, at the Bartlett uh, UCL in London about um, the sort of recent uh, early 21st century wave of little magazines and their contribution to, to architectural discourse. We also have Mark uh, Minghian, uh, who is editor-in-chief of Failed Architecture, uh, which is a research platform that aims to open up new perspective on urban failure. Field architecture seeks to develop ongoing and open conversations with experts and the public at large through traveling workshops, but also lectures. Um, and they find it crucial to examine architecture, not just from an architectural discourse, but also within wider contexts. And finally, we have Meryl Pitt. Um, Meryl is, uh, has been editor-in-chief of uh, The Architect, a widely read Dutch architectural magazine uh, since, uh, since last year, actually. And um, in 2019, uh, previous to that, she launched her own magazine called Azine. And she also actually teaches here at TU Delft, uh, as well as at the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture. Maybe we can introduce the, uh, the online panelists. Yes, yeah, so uh, the talk today is a bit different. Uh, we're actually going to have four more uh, video featurettes, and they are also going to be featured in via videos. So the first one I would like to introduce is Nuria Molinier. And she is an architect and researcher based in Spain. She works in the dissemination of architectural culture and environmental ethics within it. And currently, she is a TV host and script writer at the Escala Humana, which is the architecture documentary on TVE. Iker Gill is the founder of MAS Studio, executive director of the SOM Foundation, and editor-in-chief of the nonprofit and Chicago-based MAS Context, a periodical architectural publication which periodically delivers a comprehensive way of a single architectural topic through the active participation of people from different fields. Uh, here we have Itel Baranoa Paul, and she is a Barcelona-based critic, writer, and curator, uh, also a co-founder and of the independent research studio and publishing house called DPR Barcelona, which operates in the fields of architecture, political theory, and the social milieu. 
Her writing has been widely published both in academic and independent publication. And finally, we have Ilka Ruby. She is a Berlin-based curator, author, and publisher. She co-founded the Ruby Press, and it is a consciously overrides uh, publication that passed beyond the stereotypical formulas of the text-only theory book and the all-image portfolio. So it aims to become like a symbiotic association between the two extremes. So those are our video featurettes. Yeah, I think we, we have introduced everyone. So yeah. we can start actually, um, we can start, before we start with the videos, we can quickly introduce the talk and the, the topic of the talk, which we call the uh, disseminate. And dissemination, it's a word that was chosen for this talk because we thought it, it sort of perfectly aligns with the nature of, uh, of editorial and publishing practices, which is what we're discussing today. Um, because why, why, for example, dissemination and not communication? There is something about the word dissemination which is um, about um, dissipating knowledge without really having an idea or uh, a grasp of who is the person, who are the people that are going to receive that knowledge. Um, and actually, originally, it, it comes from uh, an idea of sort of uh, uh, throwing seeds on, uh, on, a, on a field to, to let things grow. But actually, today, we will ask you questions about the significance of of, of disseminating design knowledge in a contemporary context, but also reflecting on the historical shifts which, has affect, which have affected the ways in which we disseminate, as well as the way in which we receive um, information and knowledge about design. By doing this, we hope to discuss, for example, whether we're disseminating this knowledge in the right places, and how exactly are the current maybe more general transformation in, in the production and reception of information. How are they affecting the format, but also the content of you know, the, the traditional architectural magazine, the traditional architectural book, uh, journal, etc. cetera. Um, yes, so I think we can, we can start with the first video. The, for, the, the way the talk will be structured is that we have, we, we have four different sections. Each section has a question that we ask you, but we also ask the question to uh, the panelists which uh, gave us responses by email. So we ask you after, uh, uh, after this video to, um, to answer the question or use the question as a starting point for, for a talk, for a discussion, but also in some way also to position yourself um, with or against the statement that is made by one of our uh, online panelists. Yes, so to start off, uh, the, our first uh, video feature is Nuria Moliner, and she will be answered this question. What is the value of making architecture and urbanism available to everyone? Okay. can start now. I think it is essential to remember that architecture is culture. Architecture is also heritage. It is an intrinsic, fundamental part of each one of us. Therefore, we have to take care of it and bring it closer to society as a whole. But I'm afraid, I feel we have done quite the opposite. We have created an elitist image of architecture. For many years, we have communicated architecture from architects to architects. And we have talked too much about the architect and very little about architecture itself, about how important it is to make people feel healthier, happier, at peace. People are really interested in architecture. Everyone has questions about housing and cities and the, the challenges we will have to face in the 21st century. So we just need to address them appropriately. In that sense, I think we have a lot to learn from gastronomy. Like food, architecture is also a basic need. And at the same time, it also incorporates a technical and artistic approach. The cooks have succeeded way more when it comes to democratizing 
gastronomic culture. So hopefully we can do the same now. And I believe this is our turn to do so. Yeah, so through Nuria's words, she highlighted a lot of mishap about how in writing, architecture is supposed to be engaging with our daily lives, but in reality, it failed to give a personal impact to the mass public. She also mentioned how we should learn how to, um, how gastronomy and cooks have done so to become more personable to the normal, um, demographics. So to start off this discussion, I would actually like to ask you, Enrique, um, so is there an urgency to make architecture friendlier or more personal to the general public? Yeah. Okay, so maybe the answer to this is that, uh, and the answer to the question that you have right now projected was the value of making architecture available to everyone is, okay, people will have an opinion on architecture, whether we want it or not. So uh, people are highly opinionated on this, and it's uh, pretty much, okay, I think the parallel of food is pretty much the same. You don't need to be a cooker to know if a food is good or not for you. Uh, so I think, uh, in fact, it's part of our responsibility not to make it, um, I would say, easy digestible, like for children or something like that, exactly, but quite the opposite, to make people understand the complexities of architecture and make people understand that architecture involves also themselves. And I think it's part of our responsibility in this. Um, I would say that disseminating this in the right places, as you say, is uh, something quite difficult to know uh, because what are right places right now? Which are the right places right now for architecture? I mean, 20 years ago it was magazines, 10 years ago it was newspapers, five years ago it was blogs, right now it's Instagram, but you must have followers. Uh, I don't know what will happen tomorrow, so I don't, I wouldn't really bother about the right places because I think it, we should uh, find a holistic way of disseminating architecture that includes uh, or could surpass the formats. That's for me the, the answer to, or, or for me it's a hint of the answer to that. Thank you, and Enrique. I, I'm particularly pleased that you framed it around the concept of dissemination as opposed to communication. Some of my, my hearers would actually claim that we, there is too much communication as it is. What we lack is creation or the resistance to the presence. And I think uh, uh, I'm saying this because uh, communication presumes that there is a, some, something to be communicated between the two parties. I would like to say that perhaps we uh, underestimate our audiences by taking them to be uh, ready-made, but the audiences never, never come ready-made. They are produced, they are produced by, by what they read. Uh, so uh, any magazine, any journal, any expression is not uh, to be considered as a, a package to be consumed. Uh, it is something that, it, it is not about architecture, about world, about, it is, it is about, uh, uh, it becomes a machine that couples and produces world. So, so it's about worlding, uh, uh, I, would, I would say. That, that, that should be, the, uh, uh, to my mind, uh, the, the purpose of any good journal. So not to speak, to speak about architecture, but to actually, archi I, I'm trying to turn it into um, a verb, uh, to, uh, to what would be uh, similar to worlding would be to architecturing our audiences so they don't, that are made, are produced in the process of dissemination. Um, oh yes, it works. Um, well, I think it's very important that I make architecture stories that a lot of people can understand. I think that's the biggest aim for me in my work. Um, and what the, and of course you do that by uh, pictures. And of course, when somebody sees architecture, they have an opinion. And uh, the thing I really like now, I just started a podcast about architecture. And then you don't talk about what the result, but then you talk about the how and the why. So the attentions behind the design and how you get there. Uh, and it was um, uh, reviewed in a national uh, Dutch uh, newspaper. And it was like, okay, um, Merel showed us that we are included in the conversation. I never expected to be. And she only invites experts, but still the way they talk about it and how they um, discuss architecture, I feel included. 
they built for me, for the people, and I'm one of them, and I, I uh, yeah, I can discuss with them. And I think uh, that was for me uh, the biggest compliment I've ever had in my career. It was just uh, last week, and I was like, okay, that's what I want to do when I uh, uh, publish about architecture. So I think it's really important to do it in a way people can understand. Um, and sometimes when I, I receive a lot of architecture papers, essays, and I speak a lot of people, and then I think, okay, uh, I don't really understand this, um, and I always feel a bit stupid. And I, but now I think, okay, I studied architecture, I'm an editor-in-chief of an architecture magazine. Um, so right now I just think, like, if you can think clear, then you can write clear. So I think it's very important that um, when we write and talk about architecture and urbanism, um, that you have a, a, can have a clear argumentation about it. And I, sometimes I think that misses when we talk and write uh, about architecture. Can I? Yes, well, yes, um, it's, it was interesting what you were saying because I have a similar feeling. I, well, it rings a bell to me because I feel a bit like an imposter sometimes to be in this field of architecture, uh, you know, that running an editorial platform or, you know, um, being a critic because I never studied architecture or uh, architectural theory. Um, I'm a geographer by training, but then again, I think that is exactly what we as a platform are also trying to um, add, with it, which is first you know not treating architecture as as design objects um but really putting them in in a context of of well of space and time and culture uh politics um and um something else i was thinking about also when you, what you were saying is um what we try to do is is kind of complicate this uh the way that Architecture is very often being uh, disseminated or communicated or, you know, written about in a very um, solutionist way, you know. So here is our plan and it's going to solve everything. Um, but we like to address also the, you know, the, 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 the complex reality of cities, of societies uh, um, and, and um, relate also use architecture as um, let's say manifestations of of you know it, it's a medium also if you see a building it's a way to talk about you know more important things in society than just a building um, so that's important and then at the same time also making that uh, accessible so not um, yeah elitist um, like she was saying um, Yeah, but <clears throat> but I think that there is differences uh, among us uh, because of the specific medium that we are working with. So, Marel, you already had an audience because you ended up in this magazine and you already knew that there was a public, there was a readership, and probably architects even receive the the newspaper, the magazine <clears throat> in their mailbox. So, there is an audience, um, and maybe in Enrique's your case is also. True. So you need to um, you need to figure out what voice to do you to use, uh, what kind of language, and how to address these people. And in other cases, and that's my personal experience, we never thought of uh, what we were doing as editors in terms of the public that we would need. So it was mostly a kind of inward-looking uh, activity uh, that tried uh, to to create us as well as our uh, contributors to create a shared voice and a shared, and say, a, a space to, to share. Uh, and so it's, it's very different in our, in our case, the way we, we think of at the public. There was no public and maybe, I don't know if it is relevant that the public in our case exists or not. Uh, I think the, the video was talking about the relevance of architecture and uh, urban design in general in the society. And I think that is explicitly a task for the media industry, not necessarily for architects. So um, the, the fact that the media create um, 
a subject of discussion depends on powers that are way beyond this school. So if there is an interest in music, in punk music or whatever music, it's because there is an industry that is uh, created and they want us, they want people to talk about uh, music. There is a general interest in music, but there is also an industry that pushes back. And maybe for cooking is a similar. So it's strange indeed, uh, I agree very much with you that uh, architectural communication has been very often a solutionalist. <laughs> and then we, we need to talk more about this kind of background uh, failures, as you say, or, or problems. Um, but so I would tend to distinguish uh, our own personal experiences from, from what we might think could be valuable. I'm very intrigued by to have a view there because it's a kind of very particular opportunity for an architect to come from a world that is finally limited to attending architects, speaking to architects, and then finally having a, an incredible platform uh, where people actually read it uh, even though they might be interested in, in fashion design or whatever. So I hope they read it. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope so. Uh, well, in fact, I, I was thinking about that because it was, I was thinking pretty much, you have pretty much on point on that because uh, I have worked both sides. I have uh, edited in most, more or less independently, uh, finding my subject and trying to uh, sort out uh, a specific architect to present a specific architect or architecture to people, and the other way around. For instance, I was remembering that thing when I came here because yesterday we have a delivered a uh, little text on the centenary of Rainer Banham, or in fact, it was not on the centenary of Rainer Banham. That make uh, that I think this will make sense in my head, uh, but. Um, Right now, they have published in Spain a, a book of photographs on brutalism, and they send it to us. And honestly, I, I didn't know what to do with it. And then I found, okay, it's the 100 year of Rainer Van. And so I think I could link what I know by training and what people are interested in. But uh, as a critic in a general media, I feel pretty much like in, I'm in a boat trying to uh, find the leaks <laughs> because uh, it's the themes that comes to me. I don't have to find them. Uh, and it's very surprising how people perceive architecture from far. It's, uh, for, for me, it's, sometimes it's completely inconceivable. And it's a very interesting idea because you, you have to learn a lot and you have to be quite open to what people may mean. And also proposing things the other way around is uh, also a completely different state of mind for me. Completely, absolutely different. So it's a, I think it's a complicated balance, as you say. I, I wouldn't know how to define it, and I think I've been working this more than 10 years. I, I don't think I have found an exact balance on the two sides of the coin, but I tried to do it. I, I just, for the sake of this conversation, I want to respectfully disagree with you, just you know, to steer things up. Uh, you said the clear thoughts about clear things. This is the way to go about uh, things. I just want to remind uh, ourselves uh, about this uh, McLuhan's uh, distinction between the cold and the hot media. It's interesting from a chapter of, of his book, Understanding Media, and I will going to simplify it and make a caricature of it, but it boils down to the distinction that is like cool media is uh, a low resolution, but it demands high participation on the part of, of the people who consume it. By contrast, uh, hot media is high resolution, and that's that's what I, I would uh, say that's what you mean by clear, but low uh, participation, because you, you are fed, you are sp spoon-fed information, and you, you don't need to work hard to, in order to, to contribute, uh, as it were. I'm, of course, I'm exaggerating for the sake of, again, of, of this uh, conversation. And I, I want to say this uh, uh, because uh, recently I came across uh, an article by Claire Colbrook, who says that uh, she has identified a very peculiar condition that uh, I think all of us suffer from. She, she calls it the uh, hyper-hypo uh, attention disorder. So we are at the same time uh, completely uh, uh, hooked. Or, you know, we need to be fed information all the time. But at the same time, we, we don't have the patience or the attention span of reading more than, more than two pages. Uh, the late uh, 
Mark Fisher in, in his book uh, uh, talks about a student of his who always had uh, earplugs in his ears and he was complaining about, you know, why would you do that? He says, I'm not listening to anything, just in case, you know, I wanted to, I because he cannot stand the, without, you know, being completely plugged into the, the flow. At the same time, if I assign more than 10 pages to students, they revolt. I mean, this, they, they, they hate it. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting moment. And I think it, it's reflected in some of the recent publications like uh, Colomina and uh, Wigley's uh, Are We Human? I mean, every article doesn't span from more than two pages because they know uh, even in order for them to get across, they needed to make it into uh, digestible, to use the culinary uh, analogy, into bites. Um, well, I'm referring to a book from William Zinser on writing well, and it's written in 1960, I think. Um, and he, he, he explains how you can write about uh, whatever it is, non-fictional articles. And I really liked um, his way of how to write on a well way. And that I think in academia, and also I'll notice it when I have students working in, as an intern with me, I'm like, okay, you never learned to write here on the, on the TU Delft. And I think it's very interesting. He says, if you can say something with less words, do it. If you can say something in a short word, do it. If you can make two sentences of that one sentence, do it. And I think um, I think that's very interesting to make it. I know, don't think uh, you get lazy readers, um, but I I think um, you can also. Um, um, I don't you know, engage people in, in what you think and to take them with you. Yeah. I, I would like just to actually move on to the next section because actually the, the conversation uh, can, can continue later, but we're, we're moving now to another question that actually addresses things that we've talked about, uh, especially Carlo, on the, you know, on, on the nature of audience. Um, and the question is, what does the general public or mainstream public wish to read uh, about architecture and urbanism? And what do you think is important uh, to be read? And uh, uh, we have uh, e care and For ETEL. Our experience, we have learned that the general public loves to read new narratives that connects architecture with other fields. For instance, it can be the social, the political, the economical context. Because this is the only way to understand that architecture is not only the buildings we design or the infrastructure that surround us. Architecture is also how we create the spaces for inhabiting, but also spaces for encounter, for fights, fictions, love, frictions to happen. In that sense, storytelling is very important. And we think it is important to read books and publications that give voice to the unheard. Our cities are inhabited not only by humans, are inhabited by the botanical world, by animals, by air, by electrical waves. Uh, in the, so in that sense, more and more is important to, to read about how we interact with all these other uh, species and other actors in the cities. Well, it's hard to think about what the general public wants to, wants to read. I don't think, I don't understand it as an homogeneous piece. So there's a lot of different uh, understanding what audience could be. Uh, but to me, it's something that I, it's interesting about reading about architecture is maybe thinking about the, the behind the scenes, putting that piece, understanding that piece not as an aesthetic um, project, but also like how it fits within the larger context, whether it's like the relationship with the user, the relationship with, with the community, understanding how it fits within the city. So having that inside knowledge about why the building is produced, how it's produced, what are the constraints, what are the con what is the context in terms of legislation, budget, needs, um, understanding how it contributes to the larger pieces, why is it uh, potentially interesting, how it adds something to the city that it doesn't have at that time. And obviously, depending on the building, these conversations might be slightly different. But this idea of putting things within the larger context, not hiding it uh, behind like a complicated or like academic jargon, just trying to explain um, in simple and direct ways uh, things that they might, like a reader might not see when they, or understand when they see the building, uh, I think that contributes a lot to the understanding of why architecture is important. So, um, I mean, we, we, before we discussed on, on the nature of, uh, of, of audience and how also you within this panel might, might write for different audiences, actually. Um, 
to me, this question is, at least to me, is quite, is quite interesting because we often talk about, as we said before, general, mainstream, public. But does it, does it make sense, as Iker Gil says, does it make sense to talk about mainstream public? Does it make sense to consider it as an entity? Or maybe, you know, on the other side, if you do consider it as an entity, maybe you have to find yourself as an editor deciding and making decisions on what ideas, what projects, um, what knowledge, uh, what buildings to, to kind of to send out there, to decide to disseminate. Uh, I'd like to know your ideas on this, especially maybe, for example, does your own political position affect all of that? Um, or, or would you uh, step back and instead disseminate what you think the public um, wants to read, a public that not, might not have a pre-existing pre knowledge of architecture, or what you think a public, a general public should read about uh, um, to, to get an understanding on, on the subject. Maybe, Meryl, you can, yes. you can talk about this. Well, I just work as an architect, and I want to explain that it's a, a, um, um, it belongs to a very commercial publisher, and we have like 20 titles in... Uh, we have Bakker's World, that's about bakeries. <laughs> we have um, Bike Online. We have uh, the Kobau, that's uh, uh, management support. We have a lot of different titles, and the architect is just one of them. Um, and we also have this big scheme. I have to look at it every day, like it, it, um, how the articles go. Uh, on what articles people read, on what articles they decide to register, because you we, you cannot read our articles. You can uh, only read three for free uh, per month, only if you register. So and then I, and I can also see on what articles people decide to take an abonnement, um, what's pres prescription. So um, we it's very important for us that people that we write what people want to read. Um, so, and then if you look at that, then it's clearly that the, the public likes controversy, controversy um, firm opinions, sharp columns, uh, the latest buildings. But then again, I think as an editor, you also have a responsibility. Because what you put on the stage, because that's what you do eh, as an editor, but also as a curator or something, what you put on the stage will grow. In one way or another, so you, you put a stamp on it, mostly... Um, this, peop uh, this person is interesting uh, to interview, so you give them a stamp that it's um, uh, doing good work. So you have to think what you do. And if you look at, for example, if you look in the architecture, there are mostly men on stages everywhere, like even here, not in the video. But um, so I think it's a responsibility that I also search for women in the field who also have a good opinion, um, and also also think. Uh, it's my responsibility that I put on um, important subjects and I look for architecture um, who um, supports uh, this theme and we can write about it. But it's, it's, um, it's a very um, a hard balance because I also think you should put young talent on the stage. Um, but I can see it in our statics that um, uh, the interview with a young talent um, is less red than with Francine Huben, for example. So, yeah, we have to find the right balance, but it's um, difficult. Mark, Mark, you wanted to say something? Um, well, I don't know if I have a... I was just playing with the mic, but oh, I, yeah. I think I have some can, I can say like something. <laughs> um, so, um, this is it's super interesting and also a bit frightening to have this screen with statistics in front of you all day. Um, are you are you tempted sometimes to, to to I don't know to to drive up the statistics by you know publishing things that you know are going to do well, but are maybe not you know exactly the things that you want to publish. I don't know, but um, then you get you, your publisher comes to you like, "Good article today, Meryl. Good article. You did well." And I'm like, "Okay." And how? And because I heard, because uh, um, if I get more um, subscribers, then uh, I might hire another editor. So yeah. it's very difficult. I mean, uh, the more money I bring in, the more I can give out. Yeah. But 
actually, for someone else to answer, do you think that there is, I get, I get that feeling, do you think that there is a type of architectural practice today, usually a, a big practice, but not necessarily, of, that makes uh, the publishable quality of their work uh, a important part of their agenda? I feel like, in a way, like, it's, like we're talking PR about... PR machines, you mean? Uh, yes, in some way. You know, there are practices with big PR machines, yeah. but that really bring forward the agenda of we want, we want to be publishable. We want to be clear in some ways. I mean, uh, Nuria was talking about, you know, star, uh, buildings designed by star architects, which are completely detached. But in some way, you know, like uh, a lot of practices bring forward that agenda. You know, in some way you could talk about you could talk about populism in some mm -hmm. way, no? Within uh, within architecture today, in the ways in which certain architects bring forward, offer themselves to to magazines. Do, do you agree with that, or anyone else? Or? Maybe uh, tangentially, I'm, I'm trying to answer to more than one question, but I think there's something uh, to be said here for this. Uh, I will, I will again introduce another, another concept that uh, made me think. Uh, uh, it comes from Wendy, Wendy Chun, uh, who's written about it uh, in many of her books. The latest one is Discriminating Data. And also it comes uh, back in Shoshana Zubov, uh, Surveillance Capitalism. The idea is, uh, I will get to it, it's about chamber, uh, uh, the, the, the problem of resonance chambers. So uh, she says that uh, somehow from the urban sociology, you have this idea, you populate a certain neighborhood, so it's very close to architecture, with a certain kind of people. And she says there is a problem of homophily, where similarity breeds connection, so the same. And she says this is migrated, migrated to uh, algorithms that also shape social interaction online. And uh, the best example is when you buy a book uh, on Amazon, it says the people like you actually buy these books. So if you want to be like people like you, that is to say, more, more, everything seems to converge on, on more of, of you, of, of, of the sameness. So there's no way, uh, and this is how uh, um, uh, surveillance capitalism creates incredible, uh, incredible uh, um, like, uh, revenue. So, so uh, um, if you want to be like people like you, you buy these books. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, this, as I said, creates resonance chambers where you are simply exposed to the sameness without ever you know, exiting this and being confronted with something that forces you to think and not just simply enjoy and, and reassert your, your identity as, as it already is. And, and, and I see why, is this, why this is done, but I, but I think it it's also produces uh, the loss of knowledge, what uh, Bernard Stigler calls stupidity, the flow of stupidity, uh, and uh, the loss of, uh, of knowledge to how to live, how, how to work, and how, how to conceptualize, how, how to think. Because we are simply enjoying... Uh, it's a matter of uh, auto-affection. If, if you don't make an effort and, ex and expand your, your, uh, your bubble beyond uh, these resonant chambers, we are trapped. Uh, and I think I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think I, think I agree. I, was, I, was, I think I have my thoughts. Uh, I have some thoughts now. Because there, there were a few things that we, you were uh, saying, or a few questions at one. One, one of them was... Um, do you let your your own political views like seep through? Um, I think it. I think it's an illusion that as a journalist you can be completely objective. I think there's always subjectivity depending on your background, uh, interests, or yeah, the kind of echo chamber that you're in. Um, I think the work that we do is 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 more political and more outspoken and more arg argumentative, um, and. There and what, what I was trying to say is, um, in terms of audiences, I, I'm always trying or hoping to reach audiences that are not, you know, the people that already read other types of architecture um, uh, uh, magazines or website websites. So what we also like to do is try to go to slightly different uh, fields. One example is music. So. We went to Berlin to do an interview with uh, a house music, like a DJ producer, who produced uh, an album called Social Housing. So it was about, you know, like double meaning there, but he was also living in like 
um, in Marzahn in, in Berlin, which is a lot of public housing. So he was, also, he was also making a statement about that. And so in the article, we were talking about uh, like creative culture in Berlin, but also um, housing policies and housing politics. So, and we we could see that the the you know the article was also being spread in you know on on music, I don't know Facebook pages and, and things like that. So we were actually getting like different people to our site, um, and yeah, still. Um, also, to come back to this this idea of accessibility. Um, and what you were saying earlier, I have to think about the, like a short essay, short essay, so it's, you can read it in like 15 minutes, uh, by George Orwell, it's called uh, Politics in the English Language, and he also says like, if, if you can say it in less words, please do so, and please try to avoid the use of metaphors, you know, because metaphors are already like, um, like, dead in a way so to come up with your own ways to, to describe to, to, to describe things and 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 uh, make them you know lively as they are um and somehow i always try to i always think of um articles in the new yorker um when i'm writing something because they very much write in scenes so you, they take you somewhere you're on a tuesday morning you're you're in in i don't know on this island with these people uh and this is happening and from there they expand and talk about structures and uh and politics and systems so um yeah that's in terms of of publics and ways of talking about architecture there is um it's all it's almost like trying to infiltrate um let's say the more compl complex discussions, um, trying to infiltrate a general stage with more complex uh, ideas or debates. Also tran transdisciplinary, I guess, because you are mixing um, prolifer pro prolifically music and, and architecture, uh, trying to bring Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Maybe we can... Uh we can move to the to the next session. Any last remarks yes. or just one last um, comment or anything? The next session actually we move to slightly different topics. Yeah. To the one of public. Um, yes. So uh, in this part, it uh, we will bring back one. The previous uh, video feature it, uh, Etel, she will be featured back here, and um, uh, the, a new video feature will be Ilka Ruby. So there will be two people answering this question: Does the rise of social media and digitalization mark the end of architectural criticism as we know it? And before we start, it's like a small note since there are two speaker. Um, they will, especially Ilka, she actually going to be sharing her thought on the tangent of more of a, what digitalization does at large among what architecture is doing right now. And Itel will focus more on social media. Yeah. Okay. Uh, regarding the rise of social media as the end of architectural criticism, I don't think it's the end, it's just a new step because social media allows us to create debates, conversations, and to understand other contexts. Uh, our narrow Western point of view now can open up to other geographies, other ways of understanding what architecture is, and this is very productive, very enriching and very good for the architectural criticism field. I would say that increasing digitization also creates a counter trend. That means we, we crave analog stuff. And I still believe very much in the book as an object. I like that you can touch and feel and smell it. It is the self-contained unit um, created in a certain moment in time in a limited number and it has a specific format, specific number of pages, 
And the selection of each image and its position on the page and in relation to the text is chosen quite precisely by someone. So for me, a book is, is more than the sum of its parts, and it's the, it's the antidote to the instant gratification of, of digital imagery. So uh, through their words, I can sense there's like a um, bit of a tug of war kind of relationship between democratization and curation, because especially how editorial works now exist in both means, like in uh, printed books and also in websites. And uh, Ilka here, she shares how books and curation is the antidote to the instant gratification that you get through digital image. Whereas Etao shares how social media allows less Western-centric ownership over disseminate, disseminating tools. So with this kind of um, in between that we're here right now, I actually want to reach out to you, Mark, um, on your thought on this, because I was thinking about the website Art Daily and how it is considered like it's, it's it's um, democratic in a way that anyone can put their project on it. But the thing is, there's no curation at all. And so does it have any sort of disseminating power to the part about democratization? Yeah. Hmm. I'm, I'm add, adding on to like yeah. a, an instance that I think about. Yeah, I'm, um, so. I, yeah, I think it definitely has like a democratizing, uh, um, it is a democratizing force, even if it was just, f um, you know, for, for people, whether you're in, in or outside of the profession, to just find lots of projects uh, and get some basic details about them without having to go and buy um, buy magazines or architecture books, if, if, you know, even if you knew uh, where to find them. Um, it is, I think, if that's your only source of, of architectural media, then uh, um, that would be a shame, I think, because it lacks the, the reflection and, and the criticality. Sometimes they try to uh, invite people to write columns and to partner with other um, um, media to republish things. Um, but I think um, in its essence, I mean, it is what it is, but you need something else next to it. So, um, and we've been criticizing Art Daily and the zine like endlessly in the past 10 years. Um, so I don't want to repeat myself. Um, um, I had a few thoughts here because I think, so criticism as we know it, I don't know, there's always different modes of criticism. For example, um, like the architectural review is still here, like after 130 years, I still have a subscription and I think, I think, I still think it's a very, it's a great magazine, it's very well designed, it's well edited, it has, it's very much on point on, in terms of um, issues that are urgent today. Um, so that, um, and something else is, I had to think of memes. Um, so there's, you also see a rise of mainly Instagram accounts, but you know, just posting memes on architecture, which is another, um, another thing. Uh, but it is super interesting. They sometimes manage to capture like uh, um, a big idea or a big type of criticism in just one image. And sometimes they're just vague. And I think even the, the creator doesn't even know what exactly they were meaning by it, but it's just like, funny or, uh, but still, I think that also adds to uh, a wide spectrum of approaching architecture and also making it, um, uh, yeah, like like disseminating uh, more critical takes. And actually, Twain, I, I was looking at your your uh, your bio, and you were saying uh, one of the things it says was um, you're interested in post irony cultures, and a meme culture is is super ironic. Of course, it's it's um, it's it's like millennial stuff 
completely, like non, well, not, I was going to say non-committal, not necessarily always, it's sometimes also political. Um, so I don't know if you want to say something about this, like how, what, do you, what do you, do you think of post-irony in terms of uh, when, when you think about architecture yeah. publishing? Uh, I think the post-irony, um, the post-irony that I'm talking about is a lot about how we don't see it as an, um, see sometimes uh, the things that we make in architecture, sometimes we don't think about how the, the reality of it, how it can affect people, but then there's some little things, for example, a door that is not center on the wall, instead of criticizing it, we actually embrace it as our mistake. So I think that's like post-rationalization is similar to being post-ironic about something. Uh, I think that is an okay thing about architectural criticism because um, like instead of being critical in a way that we go against it, we actually kind of understand why and where they came into terms of that, and then we try to have it more of an open conversation instead of just going against things. Yeah, so that's what I see Paul's irony is. It also yeah. feels like this, this kind of counter m movement or another way to look at, or a counter way to, to, to the more perfectionist uh, kind of way that uh, architecture is being presented. Yeah, um, I agree. Because a lot of us, I feel like um, <laughs> we're just digesting criticism through mostly accounts, like you said, like memes and even honestly architecture trying to be presented on TikTok. And that is very different from where we are right now. But yeah. Um, I guess, Enrique, you, I saw you writing notes. I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts to share. But it, it, they were notes from myself. First of all, I would say, uh, okay, we are somehow punishing gratification here, and I want to say I, I have nothing against gratification. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I would say that it's not so bad. And the second thing is maybe the idea that uh, has come uh, the idea of democratizing publications uh, or democratizing pages or webs, we have talked about it, is pretty much like saying that yellow pages democratizes us, as making us part of literature history. It's not true, simply it's not true. It's only information. We have to, it's so completely uh, different from criticism or editorial uh, practice for me. Um, but the thing is, uh, as I said at the beginning, I don't think the formats are uh, really quite something into this. Uh, we are pretty much into them, but uh, for me they are not very important. I mean, um, I, I will call the Victor Hugo thing, this, this will kill that. Uh, I think the book will kill the building. Now it seems that the TikTok will kill the book, and we don't know what will, it, what will kill TikTok, but I think we will see it. Uh, but it's, it's something that happens every four or five minutes, and I think we should stop worrying about it, because it's not really important. Um, the thing that you have said that uh, maybe we don't, uh, we usually look at architecture in an architecture in an architectural point of view, so as to say, is um, it's quite interesting because uh, at least for me it happens every time. Uh, and uh, when I feel that I made my work best is when I'm not interested in the subject I'm writing at all because I can detach completely from it and I can understand it from a different point of view. Uh, for instance, I have to write about uh, library somewhere, uh, I, f I find it completely irrelevant to think or to tell people that they, it's well composed or uh, it's well placed into the work of this architect in some way, and to think why is a library important there? What does mean a public library in Spain? How it comes from the idea of the democratic constitution and the idea of disseminating knowledge in, in the, the, the whole political territory of Spain, and the parting of the, of the country into several, into several autonomies, and how it makes sense in that city to have a library, and uh, the building is only a little fragment of that history. And I think that is the way for me for telling people what architecture is. And I think it's what people can understand about architecture. They, they need to know why things are important, and it's not a, 
aesthetic point of view or a um, disciplinary point of view, but something that has to intertwine itself into political territory, into economical history. And it's, I, I think it's very interesting to do it that way. And it happens, for me, it happens every time I'm not really pretty much interested in the building. I have to think about something I can tell to the readers. So sometimes, the old formats, the formats that will be killed, I think they are relevant because they force you to say anything. At the beginning, I, I was talking a little, uh, at the beginning I was talking to Merrill and say, do you have a, a political instance and everything? I don't. I, many times I have to think what I have to, what, what is my opinion on something? And it's not automatic. I'm very bad at first reactions, as you may see in this. <laughs> but uh, I think the old format, the read format of uh, the writing page, the format we crave for, I, I like it very much because it makes me write an opinion in a, it makes us, because I write with my partner, it's a, a work for, of two people, it makes us write an opinion in a specific format, uh, in, a in a determined number of words and characters, and uh, everyone has to understand it. So it's, uh, the format sometimes is a liberation from that, and it makes you, I think it's, Pretty good. You are, it's a pretty good uh, way of working. I think it's called uh, enabling constraint. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 for me, it's very, it's very useful. Yeah. I just want to add something. Uh, um, this morning we had a, a set up a lecture, and, and uh, I was uh, trying to address this this problem of curated or not. To, to my mind, that's another of those internal questions of whether it's one or the many. How do we negotiate the two part to whole relationship? Do we have something fully curated or we just let things be so anything goes and so on? And then I, I, was, I, was, I used the anecdote of that recently I was at first incredibly pleased when I learned that the USB charger is finally standardized so I can just lose 12 different cables that I have and I have one. But then on second thought, I, th I thought, my God, this means that from now on, the, all these startups that are trying to come up with something better uh, have no chance because it's now fully standardized. So, so, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I was, then I was, I was thinking, how is it that we pay so much lip service to the idea of uh, biodiversity and everybody's into that and says, oh, this is wonderful. But when it comes to techno diversity, we, we, we somehow are, are very quick to uh, qualify things and, and, and uh, you know, uh, converge on a point again. Yuk Hui has written about this, uh, the necessity to, 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 to take techno diversity as seriously as, as uh, biodiversity, because I, I think that answers this question that will this kill that? No, it won't. It will just, you know, let, let's just uh, uh, not think in terms of exclusive disjunction, but inclusive disjunction, and this, and this, and this, and, and let that see how it unfolds uh, from here. Carlo, you wanted to say Yeah, no, I, I wanted to bump in, uh, into um, Enrica because you were saying, okay, I'm in, interested in, as an architect, uh, to understand the building not just as an aesthetic uh, phenomenon, but just uh, also its political, economic background. And, and I think this kind of attention is specific to architects, because we've been overwhelmed with these talks about aesthetics and pictures, and now we have wanted to explore more. But if you put yourself in, in the relation, and I think this is the role that you have in writing for the weekly magazine, not just in general as a teacher, is that you, you are trying to disseminate architecture to a public. And, and so I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't drop the, the task, the duty to make uh, architectural space, aesthetics uh, accessible to people through your writing. Um, I, I think sometimes it could be sound like an excuse to say, okay, whatever the building looks like, uh, there is a building and this is the reasons, these are the reasons why the building is there. And whereas it, for me, it, it is very interesting also to, to analyze uh, or to kind of interpret a, a building through writing, through photography, and to try and grasp why it is let's say it responds uh, to, to the task, to the brief, in an intelligent or, or very stupid manner. So if we go back to your idea of the library, there are libraries where they're really democratic, they really disseminate their, their own content, the books, and, uh, and others would finally are kind of the, the product of, let's say, of, of a bad series of intentions. 
Uh, I wanted also to connect with what Ilke said of the interest uh, of the book. Indeed, the, the digital turn has not only affected criticism, but al also the way we produce architecture, we think architecture, also what happens on site, on the construction site. And, um, and I agree with her that um, maybe the, the move to the digital space of a lot of architectural discourse has liberated very much the, the tangible, she said, the analog uh, formats uh, of the duty of disseminating um, news. So uh, until the 90s, uh, magazines were the fastest. You, had, you read uh, the architectural review because you had on time what new buildings were out there. And now the, even architectural review is no longer in charge of that. So they say other media or maybe their own blog will take care of that. And so it liberates very much the, the paper space of those magazines, even more than the little magazines that I publish and others publish, for, to, to fill in that space with things that are relevant, that, that are critical, that kind of make sense into, into this mass. And there have been periods in which uh, magazines, very well-established magazines like Domus or the Architectural Review, uh, have changed the, their mode. So they were maybe less big magazines, and they were trying to understand what was happening in the countercultures, what was uh, happening in discourses of architecture that were not trying to enforce the dominant uh, values. And maybe this is, for these times, provide that kind of opportunity. So the, even the review, maybe they certainly have much less advertisement. They have less pages. Uh, I don't know if they're as frequent as they used to be. Uh, that thing, I don't know. But I'm sure that there is something in there, a, a challenge for editors of established magazines to, to keep on making sense <clears throat> after their big arm has been cut of the, the, let's say, the trees of delivering the news. So I think that that is a very interesting time to see um, how do they, who have a public, who have the financial structure, uh, who maybe can also hire interesting people, how do they respond to that? And then for the rest, of course, criticism is is, uh, is an ecology in itself. There's so many modes, so there's, we're not trying, I think, to agree everybody on what criticism should be, but there, there could be this kind of uh, quick criticism, funny, ironic, post-ironic, I don't know, criticism, it's everything is good, <laughs> whatever, even likes, maybe. Um, so, final line, I think it's the responsibility of uh, this dissemination ends up in these very well-established magazines. I'm very curious about how do they respond to, to that situation. Yeah. Miro? Should I answer? We are an established magazine in the Netherlands, I could say. Um, I started working there um, after I graduated in 2008. And then we made like 12 magazines a year. Um, and right now we make four. And we have less advertisement, we have less readers, um, and it's a challenge. Um, I think we can, uh, we can say that the, um, um, the subscribers and the, the advertisements are going down still. And luckily, since uh, uh, this year, we're going a bit up with the online uh, subscribers and advertisement. Well, mostly a subscriber. So we finally found a counterpoint that we're not losing money anymore, but we're okay, and within this big publishing company, uh, we can s still exist, but it's very tricky as it has been uh, last year. And I, I think it was from 2008, then the crisis in the architecture started, but also in the printed magazine uh, land. So it's, it's difficult, and um, how we survive, we hope in the end that people are, uh, are willing to pay for good online architecture. Yeah, you talk about criticism, I don't know exactly what architecture criticism is. I'm, I, I've did a, a lot of interviews about it, a lot of research. I, I followed a lot of lectures about it, but I still don't have an answer what architecture criticism is. So I, I rather talk about architecture journalism sometimes. Um, but okay, 
Um, we are trying to make, um, right now, good online publications um, where people are willing to pay for. And we also have like this uh, new products like podcasts and videos uh, to reach a bigger audience. So they find their way to our website, hopefully, and uh, are willing to uh, subscribe. And it's, it's a big challenge, it's uh, difficult, and it's also uh, difficult how you uh, approach them. Because I also know when I started studying architecture, um, I took a subscription on the architect, exactly what you say, to uh, be um, informed about the new buildings, and I took a subscription on Argis. Uh, so, both for me, there were two stories that are very important, uh, but now I think hardly any student has a subscription on the architect. They say, no, it's too expensive, and if you want to do it, it's like nine euros a month. Uh, so, not that much, I think. No. Do, do, can I ask Miro a question? <laughs> So do you think it's an advantage to be part of a, a publishing house that has maybe, I don't know, like Baker's World that is super successful, <laughs> that they can, that brings in a lot of money and then maybe they can yes. use that to support uh, an architectural magazine in times when, you know, that magazine is not doing... Yeah, well, I, 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 I started my own uh, uh, magazine. It was quite successful, uh, actually, because I was uh, bringing on a new perspective on architecture. Uh, but earning money <laughs> is a different uh, thing. So um, the, uh, then you have to do also sales, marketing, and uh, you have to think, so that wasn't my thing. So I thought, okay, when I started this big company, everything is arranged. So you have, I have uh, a department who does the sales, I have a department who does the marketing. But So there are advantages, but also disadvantages. So because we have a website, we were now... Um, almost having a new one, we're starting the migration. It's the same as all the other titles. So, but most uh, titles use stock images. We have a very nice, good images in architecture. So that when you have the same website as Baggerswereld or <laughs> Bike Online, that's not so nice. So we're trying to tweak, and as soon as you start tweaking, it's, it's getting more expensive, so. It's uh, it's quite a challenge actually. To, uh, so, um, but I, I get paid to make architecture stories. So that's uh, you're you're an exception. Yes, I know. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, do you want to make the last remarks? And yeah. we can oh, I, I was thinking also there was this um, Iker Gill's um, intervention uh, from uh, mass content. It's actually I've uh, I'm studying so many independent magazines and his one is one of those who's finally found a, a so you have the the actual magazine I think it is thought of for being a print magazine but also every content is, is available online and that is a great opportunity because kind of two days ago uh, I received in my email uh, a list of articles that maybe I didn't survey because they can republish them and so and that is a great, I think, opportunity. Uh, footprint also, uh, I know it mostly through the PDFs, and that's great. <laughs> and the Phenambulist is also a magazine that started as a blog. They published the journal. The journal has the great capacity of existing, so you, you can bring in around, but also they keep on delivering content on the website. I was wondering, so, um, the counterpoint to that is that when you do an editorial work, the format is paramount, and so usually you, you need to stick one to one idea, and this is why I understand also the, um, um, that your project is a blog, is online, and, uh, and it makes sense that it is, so that you don't have the blog and the publishment, etc., uh, etc. Et but I was wondering, if you were considering to, to create some kind of outputs to print, or if it already happened, or that, does it make sense? Uh, or so I think I don't know if the examples I gave is that basically you start from yeah. print and then you you yeah. publish online and so it. yeah I don't and and us being the other way around perhaps so I don't know if it makes sense but that is something we're doing now um, so we kind of. 
I think a few years ago we started doing uh, calls for articles around specific themes, um, and these are now going to be, um, you know, that all the articles that um, connected to that theme are going to be published in um, in a publication. Um, so there's going to be a series of that, and then we're also adding. I think one or two new articles, and I'm not sure yet if they're going to be, uh, you know, hard, so print only, or they're also going to be on the website. Um, but this is this is an interesting, and it's connected to also our business model, which is not really a business model because we're mainly just it's voluntary work. And we have um, like su subscribers or uh, people who donate money every every month, um, and we were thinking of you know maybe creating something that we can give those people in return. Um, so it's it's kind of trying. It's also experimenting in this in this 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 time, I guess, um, and experimenting with different. Media, and that's also why we are moving. We, we we've been doing this podcast for a couple of years now, which is also um, fantastic. It's so nice to do to do like um, you know in depth interviews or more like documentary type audio, um, but it takes a lot of time, and there's no you know it's 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 mainly you know uh, voluntary work. Um, just same with. Our so we have a team also in New York and um, a few other cities like Bogota and Istanbul, um, and the New York team started doing a Twitch uh, show. So uh, Twitch is this video streaming platform that is mainly used by, uh, by gamers, yeah. uh, so that you can look at someone else gaming and then uh, you know people can discuss it while they're doing it, and we are. It's basically like. It's basically the, the the online version of what we're doing here, and they're doing a monthly show there. Um, and um, so it's one big experiment. And um, the the downside is that there's no like uh, steady income. So sometimes we we get uh, a bit of funding to do one project, you know, to get started with a podcast or with a publication. Um, some seed money, basically, and then uh, the challenge is to, you know, to to um, to continue it. Um, so very often it turns out that these things become slightly irregular, you know. So there's not monthly things, but it just happens whenever whenever we're available. Um, we do have we have one last question that we could use to conclude, but before actually people maybe have to go catch train, trains or drink, uh, I wanted to ask to the audience if there is any question, actually. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, you can go to the mic on, the, on, on your left side. Yes. Does anyone have any questions? Javier has a question. <laughs> um, I will try to break the ice uh, with the audience. But thanks, of, thank you very much. And I will, I will spare the thank yous um, so far for the time being. Um, it was really interesting to hear you talk about the hows, the whys, but I didn't hear so much about the what. What is it that we publish or what is it, what is it that we don't publish? Asking you maybe now, what do you publish? What do you curate or what do you edit? It's probably complicated. So I want to ask you all, this is an open question, please answer one by one, however you wish. What is it that you don't publish? What is it that you decide not to uh, curate or not to talk about? I have ideas, I could, if I was, I would say something, uh, maybe that's a little stupid, and uh, just a provocation. I have never published a single family home in my life, and I will never do that. It's a question, I started a series of publications which is called Density, in which we were, uh, let's say, advocating for collective housing. So I took the decision, or we took the decision, of not including amazing projects that were being produced, of course, around the world. So we decided not to do, and I never did it again. I would like to know whether it's 
there is something you have decided already that you will never include in your writing, publications, exhibitions, etc. You may look, because, but uh, I, w I have the same restriction <laughs> the idea of non-single homes. It, in fact, it's not a self-imposed restriction, but we started writing. Uh, they told us uh, in the newspaper they don't publish single homes because they are not public architecture and they have to uh, public uh, <laughs> architecture people you know, normal people can visit. So uh, it's something that came uh, at the beginning. It was very frustrating because we started writing right in the middle of the crisis in Spain and there were no public buildings, so we had to scratch to find things to, to, talk, to talk about, to write about them. There were many single homes building, being built, and even many interior reforms being made, and still they are, but uh, we couldn't do it. Uh, the other thing we try not to publish is, uh, what we try not to do is to uh, write about what everyone is writing right at the moment in terms of building. I mean, if there's an opening of a building there and there's going to be 54 uh, different articles the same way. We try not to do so. And when even uh, we work in a newspaper, so they want us to write about it. And we try to resist uh, somehow making an interview to someone different, somehow to displacing the uh, discussion from the building, try not to write the same thing everyone is going to write. People does not need to write my opinion, my particular opinion on a building. They are going to read 50 articles that week. They don't, need, they don't need that at all. So we try to do that. Not, we are not successful all the time, but we try, we try to do that. And the other thing is, sorry, it's, a consideration, it's completely coincidental, but is that exactly? Single family homes there, but Andre, I think you want to answer something. In, in our case, uh, uh, the editorial board uh, consists of 12 people uh, on average and uh, it, we have never had such uh, uh, I mean we always discuss things and we as it were one comes up with an idea and it needs to be convincing enough for the others to say yes it's a go uh, but I, I can't recall any moment that uh, you know we have overruled anything so far but it, it made me think you know I, 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 I'm trying to wonder whether that would be the, the case it's but but sometimes the, we have long and painful negotiations where the board is uh, requiring more and more uh, uh, you know, disambiguation of a, of, a, of a certain project, especially if it's completely kind of uh, 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 radical, let's put it this way. Um, so, I, I, but it's a, it's a wonderful question. I, I, it makes me think. Uh, Any more no-go zones? Or? Uh, we will never publish, um, I don't know, right-wing ideas. That's the general, I think, asset we have. Uh, it's Our work is a collaborative project. We are five. And I think none of us has ever would ever be fair with that. Uh, we did publish uh, houses, but also the way our magazine is a particular hybrid because we don't write about someone else's work. We try to, most of the time, we invite that person to discuss, uh, to find a way to present that work together with us. So also the way we produce criticism is different from uh, the typical, uh, let's say, critical essay. Um, but nonetheless, we try not to create a, a showcase of that person's beautiful work, be it an architect or a photographer or an artist. So we, we try to figure out how to, uh, how to create a zone where we can discuss uh, his or her work but without trying to beautify it too much. We, we, we acknowledge that beauty, but we try to also find a lateral, especially to find a lateral uh, approach to that. And I meet with Enrique, sometimes projects are kind of too overwhelming, so it's definitely not there where we want to go. But we, we don't have any, <laughs> any weekly kind of uh, temporality, so we are mostly publishing every year or every nine months. So it's also what's hot, what's in the news, is, might be very different from the kind of mind frame where you are following the news on a weekly basis. But, but it's not like dogma, you know? It's not something like, okay, I can do this, and if I do this, no. It's sometimes you have to write about something, and, and you try to find a, a fresh angle, a different angle. And I think that's exciting, too. 
not many times, but it okay. comes next week. So <laughs> the, the Pritzker Prize comes next week. So I'll have to write maybe in an Another, afternoon, yeah. in an hour's time. Yeah. Mark. Mark, yeah. Yeah, I think we we never publish an article that doesn't that doesn't have an art argument or a judgment. Um, and I th I re I'm recalling some editorial discussions now on our Basecamp software. Um, it's I think something that's recurring is always that we're always asking. So what is the spatial implication of this of this argument that you're making? Um, so, but that's not a no. So, uh, yeah. And Meryl, I have, I suppose that you are confronted to lots of work on a daily basis that you have to choose from, no? Yes, and, and they keep calling me when I'm going to publish it. Um, well, because we have now four issues a year, and I was wondering, okay, how I'm going to deal with it, because we're never, uh, we're never actual, actual, uh, so, now we thought about um, to have a theme on every issue and also online we work on that theme and also our podcast is on that theme. And I think it's quite interesting to do it that way because you choose something different than uh, uh, different projects than the projects that are hot at that time. So um, it really works because you uh, work on different levels on the same theme. So uh, <coughs> we just worked on um, building in... Um, Harbor areas, former harbor areas, how do you do that? And then um, all, from all over the world, so that was nice. And the next issue is about bio-based building. And just uh, recently a museum uh, was opened, Singalaren, and I was there. And there were already five other journalists and they already published their article. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to write anything about it anymore. But that also I don't have to because um, I can publish it on the website before the the monthly team of the three uh, the quarterly three team. I don't have to. And I want to one, uh, make one remark: the best um, visited projects are single <laughs> homes. <laughs> so yes, we publish them, <laughs> oh. and um, and we don't publish. Um, um, well, we're not. That's something uh, because it's very uh, diff difficult that. We write about our target audience. So we write about architects, but they are also our subscribers and they have to deliver us the drawings. So we're not very negative. So if we think a building sucks, we won't publish it. Why, why do you think people read, want to read more about uh, family villas, for example? You said that you, yes. you, you do publish it because you receive uh, uh, yeah, they, you receive a visualization. Why, why do you think so? It's very nearby, I think. It's uh, something people can relate to, all uh, the whole audience. Like we have urban designers, architects, and interior designers. So when we write about an urban plan, uh, hardly any uh, interior architect will read the article. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, well, thanks, Javier, for the question. Yeah. I saw someone next to the mic that maybe wanted to ask a question. No? Okay. Um, I... Oh, yes. Maybe we have a question. Yes. Hi, uh, thanks for interesting this discussion. Um, I was wondering because there is always these new independent small magazines coming up and there's always people who seem to want to kind of disseminate these ideas their own way. And what, why do you think this keeps happening, you know, despite the rise of social media, that people want to produce the magazines and um, what keeps them going? Um, you know, outside of, despite all the issues that you talked about with the financial uh, situation. So, yeah. Can, That's can for me. Yeah. Wants to answer this. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, well, making magazines is, is not necessarily, I wouldn't put it in terms of dissemination, uh, but rather of the experience of um, handling this material 
um, with your own hands. So I think producing a magazine, also a student-run magazine within a school or whatever occasions is ways to keep on um, discussing and learning architecture. So it's a kind of a third cycle. People can do a PhD or make a, a little magazine. And um, I never heard that financial reasons were a problem because usually you work on a voluntary basis. I was surprised that you also work a lot on a voluntary basis. We, we've been having this magazine for seven years and we never got paid for the work we do. And this is why also very often those kind of little magazines get to exhaustion after two issues, six issues, sometimes ten issues. And, and that's perfectly normal. Some die and a new one will be born. And uh, so th there is a frequent, uh, let's say, rejuvenation of the project. But also there is a tradition by which uh, magazines are kind of uh, re... I don't know, taken out of the closets, quoted, and uh, so it's very funny to track that. Uh, sometimes even magazines are totally frantic. So the, the Dutch magazine forum was a kind of a, it had a, a very long span. For a while it was a very important magazine with Bakema, et cetera, and then it became very private. It used to publish smaller practices, and it was a bit more precious. Then it got totally crazy with uh, Winnie Mass, I think, for a couple of issues, uh, and then it died, <laughs> and then we don't know. So it's funny. Sometimes it's within the same title, things change, and sometimes it's just uh, one idea that was developed by a magazine is picked up by a new one uh, a few years afterwards. And uh, so I don't know. Did I answer your question? Maybe it has to do with having something to say, which is more important than any financial constraint, isn't it? Because I was thinking about there is, you know, this graphic, which is cost and demand uh, in, in economy. We start with cost up here, and when demand grows, cost bill goes, and there is a point which is equilibrium. And I think if we translate it to magazine, it will say, having something to say, having no money, starting money, and the point it grows, magazine dies. <laughs> I think it would, be, it would translate that way. <laughs> um, I guess on the tension of that, is it kind of like, for example, for you working for a very established publishing house, like you know, it's kind of like how you said you don't share your opinions too much in a piece, but rather a collective of opinions. And you trying to be neutral about it. So then it, it means like, does that mean smaller magazine tends to be more radical than bigger magazine, something like that? Do you, would you say something about that? Like because of that, that equilibrium point, and then no, you. No, it, it has yeah. for me. It's only a, a, a personal way of doing things. So I, I try not to uh, be too opinionated when saying something. I mean, of course, I, I have my opinions about things, and I, when I write about something, mainly it's because it interests me. Yeah, but uh, that's uh, that's uh, I think that we can take that for granted. But uh, I th I will say that I try not to be too opinionated because I don't even trust myself in that because I I may think completely different about it and, and I it has happened me to me many times before and to us we have seen projects ten years later and how how this could interest me or, or what I did not see this. So I tried to distrust me, and it's something that has to do with me, not with the idea of, of making an opinion and an argument. On the other hand, I think you're right, but I, I think it has to do with Carlos said this. It has to do with having something to say with the magazine, with having something, and you, you have something to say. You tend to be radical, of course. You tend, make, you tend to be assertive, of course, and you try to make a stance on the world. So it's almost inevitable. I think. Maybe I will um, ask a question, actually, to if no one else has anything to say on the subject, but uh, also to sort of uh, uh, conclude the talk. Yeah. It's getting late. Someone has to go back to Brussels. I don't remember who. But you, he has to go back to Brussels at some point. But... Um, so, actually, this question was going to be 
the last question, but we, we are in the situation which is a bit more informal, so, um, but I'm gonna maybe phrase it in a, in a different way. It was, it was answered by Il Karubi as well, and you know, we are, um, it's quite clear how uh, architecture and urban design communicates through visual means. Uh, we all know that, but maybe it's today, it's, uh, it's, that's more the case than what it was in the past. Within, within the, the architectural environment, we are bombarded by images, especially digital images. So images which are digitally produced, like renders, or uh, images which are digitally edited as well. And, uh, but also these images, they reach the public through, you know, through newspapers, but also uh, through construction sites. Through real, real estate, for example, is a big one that uses uh, interiors renders to, to, to work. Um, and, um, and so it seems to me that uh, they come to, digital images come to sort of uh, affect the way people uh, perceive their perception of, of cities and buildings, um, but also their expectations towards them. You know, there was the big uh, question uh, about, for example, the MVRDV um, uh, mound in London, and people were expecting a landscape, a, a lush landscape that they could, could climb to the top. And instead, they found out something different. Um, there was it's an expectation. All, it's all gated in the beginning. So. Yes, well, um, I, I, it's up to everyone to go and look at images of how it was, but, uh, and it's a big, anyway. But I, what I'm saying is that there is, a, there is a, always a game of expectation versus reality today, I feel like. And, and publish and editorial practices play an important part in this, I think. Um, does anyone have to want to share something about what you think is the role and value of digital images? For example, Andre, you were talking about, for example, attention, lack of attention, how the images might be gratifying in some ways. I, I, made it, I, I, I made it my business really for years now. Uh, in, um, every opportunity I have to remind people how ocular-centric our culture is, our civilization. Uh, we are completely, completely uh, driven by, you're not just in the didactic uh, practices, everything to do with images. So I appreciate the idea. Uh, again, I have to refer, I'm, I'm pointing to the screen where, where we were told about this uh, culinary uh, um, turn. Uh, so that involves cross modality, olfactory systems, uh, taste buds, uh, space that is not just visual space, but also haptic space. And uh, we have, uh, I think uh, it's slowly starting to uh, play the role. Music, the sound, uh, uh, soundscapes and so on. So uh, I, I use any and every opportunity to hook up with people uh, from the uh, sound studies and uh, just, just to expose architects to more than just uh, uh, visual simulation. And I, and I think it, they, they appreciate it always, but they always, but, but it also, it seems to me there's a, there's a tradition, there is a book wonderful by uh, Martin Jay, uh, Downcast Eyes, and he gives a genealogy of this long ocular centric tradition in, in, the, in the West, and, and something I think we have to work uh, against. Yeah, um, if I may say something, because what you said earlier I think was super interesting this idea of the low res versus high res. Because I think, of course, the way architecture is, is presented for, I don't know, since one or two decades um, um, is through these hyper-real, hyper-realistic uh, renderings, of course. And I, so hyper-real means that they're even more real than, than reality, you know? The reality is not going to turn out like this. But then again, they also seem so real that there's... You know, it's, it's like there's nothing to do about it. Okay, this is going to be what's going to be built there. Um, and I think it would be like, the, so a low res version would be much more interesting to, as, um, as a discussion piece. So if it's kind of a, like a vague, um, and this is very ut utopic, uh, you know, utopian, of course. I know it's not going to happen because of, you know, real estate um, uh, reality, etc. Um, if it would be a more vague um, 
impression or a suggestion of what a future could be like, then I think more people would have the feeling like, hey, I can have, I can say something about this. There's, this thing is open for discussion. Um, so, and I think there's the been level like... Of, the level of indeterminacy that allows everybody to contribute somehow. It's not fully closed. Eh? Or, or That's or, it, yeah. So it's not this hermetic, uh, like sealed, um, um, thing. Um, so there's been a lot of criticism towards the, the use of renders for, for also for, for um, I guess, maybe a decade now. Um, and I, I think there's also a counter uh, thing happening, you know, with more like the collage type of uh, visualizations, which, um, which I applaud, which I think is great, because it's in, in the direction of what I'm um, of what I what I would like, but then again, you see them only happening for uh, for single-family homes, you know, single homes, or or maybe sometimes for like a museum building or so. Um, so yeah, it's it's still kind of it's either reserved for the more cultural artistic sphere or like the the, the like. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about Fala, for example, the Portuguese uh, uh, superstars. And I think they are superstars because of their visualizations uh, that they created, that they kind of, with the, you know, the pastel kind of coloring and the collage um, um, images that are super appealing. But they're all, I think they're only doing private, private homes. Um, I think it's also a shame that these uh, renders are so important right now because uh, you produce it as an architectural practice and then you have to try for the next years to reach that image while the world is changing, while the um, yeah the materials are may maybe getting more expensive or you can find something else. Like if you want to make a really circular buildings, you cannot make like this end image. It's impossible. So I think we should um, get away that. from it. <laughs> You mean because then you don't, because circular means also that a building is like becoming. And yes, it's, exactly. It's yeah, but you 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 going on a uh, a hike to find the materials you're going to use. So you never know what you're going to find. You know, and so you you cannot make the render. But how do you deal with uh, with renderings? Because I think you you get a lot of like press releases sent to you yes. with the Yes, well, the, the more in-depth articles are always about uh, the uh, realizations or the interviews. And of, of course, we, I have um, this web editor. She used to um, publish six articles a day. And then, of course, they used the uh, press kits. And then we got a lot of renders. But now we got away from it a bit. So only maximum one. Uh, twice a week we publish it, and then it's more like, okay, someone won this um, competition, and then you, 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 you obviously uh, show it with a render, but we don't really write about the renders. And if they're being, sorry, just a final remark, if they're being published anywhere, it's usually, you know, in our daily or the zine, or in, you know, average or average just national newspapers, and they're not really being contextualized. It's mostly like the republishing of this of this press um, press yeah. release without you know um, any critical assessment of it uh, in order to you know kind of maybe create a public debate around something that is not there yet. So now is the time to maybe uh, do something about it if you don't like it. Yeah, it only starts when. And other architects' building is being ruined by this new render. Then you get some uh, <laughs> discussion about the, the render, I think. But you, you could also. I know there is a question. Okay, then let's stop it here. Yeah, Next question. Uh, on this topic, um, there is a lot of negotiation. Of, oh, sorry. Hi. I, um, I see that there's a lot of negotiation about these renders, and I feel like indeed they they, they are are closed. There you can picture the city like uh, you know they are published all around the city in front of the real estate projects that are in development. And you can think of it like a like a city through full of all sorts a future that is only accessible to the few most of the times. You know, and um, you know there's a lot of graffiti on these 
renders all the time. So there is a negotiation, but it's like, you know, you don't see who writes it. I think that's very telling about what architecture discourse is about today. You, you don't see what, sorry? You don't see who writes the comments. I mean, if it's a tag or it's a, it's a slur or whatever, it's uh, something about, you know, uh, how, how people are being affected by these, uh, by these images populating their city, you know. So they're, they're yeah. Super nice uh, addition, yeah. I'm, you just gave me an idea for, uh, for an article. Well, I, I think we should... You, you write the article. Oh, I know who should write it, actually. So it's not me, but... Uh, okay, well, tell me who, yeah, yeah, who should it. do it. No, but definitely, I think a lot of a lot behind rendering, especially when it comes to construction sites. But also, I mentioned real estate before. I feel like you know what real estate does is to sell. It doesn't really sell uh, spaces. It sells lifestyles, right? And um, and these 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 images which advertise lifestyles, they're all, they're all around the city, as he said. But not, but not everyone in the city is accessible, has access to those, to those lifestyles. It's not just uh, private lifestyles um, in your home. It's also public lifestyles of how you go to a cafe, a cafe or to a square, how you, how you dwell in the city, you know? So, so. I, I just wanted to mention there is a person who has coined a neologism, uh, not gentrification, but gentrifiction, uh, uh, Helen Frishaw. I think she's really writing about what we are now describing. I was thinking of her too. Anyone else? I think uh, it's a good time to wrap up this uh, talk. I think that like the idea of dissemination, like going back to how we all started this, um, like framed this talk on that word, I think it's very important how it's not just about the writing, but also the images that we do. And now like we're also going into podcasts and like, even trying to distribute these information and knowledge that we know, but the, the output and the audience, it's kind of unknown, and they're all very heterogeneous kind of thing. And I think that is so interesting, and the work will never end. We'll just keep going, and that's very exciting. How there's room for more conversation and more, for example, you just got like, a collaboration just now <laughs> within the PK talk, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah, Hopefully, so, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess we can wrap up there. Uh, I think either Ifra or Javier wanted to talk yeah. about uh, events in the future. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can we please give uh, our panelists a wonderful round of applause? Thank you guys very much for such a lively discussion. I myself also had a few questions as well. Maybe I'll email you guys later, who knows. But uh, in the meantime, we uh, have upcoming BK Talks and our most, uh, uh, well, our upcoming one on the 24th of March is called Data, 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 Design in the Era of Artificial Intelligence. And so there we will be discussing the role of AI, the role of computing, the role of uh, well, digital media and digitalization in design and how that uh, creates uh, opportunities and threats uh, for design at large. So we invite you all to join us for that discussion. Uh, in the meantime, I wish you all very well and thank you very much for coming. Can I say one last thing? Maybe it's not broadcast. It's for them. It's for the people sitting there. But uh, maybe, I don't know if we mentioned it, but for B News, we publish students' articles. So please, send us some articles. And also, there was the question which was, uh, have you ever decided not to publish anything? Never happened to us, but we're really looking forward to some really radical articles that are difficult to publish, you know, some stuff that we really have to think about and discuss about. So please, write to us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.